Hello everyone and welcome to episode 9 of the Slide Rule Pass podcast, your weekly football podcast brought to you from the makers of Slide Rule Pass blog. In this week's episode, we're going to take a look at the club corner where we've got one right result and one shite result for both our clubs. Also take a look at the rest of the action in the Premiership and EFLs. Also taking a look at what's going on in the news today, including the uh, the massive uh, impact from the Manchester United-Liverpool game that never was. I'm your host Chris and as always I'm joined by my podcast and bud Mark. How are you big man? I'm good, thank you mate. How's it going? Yeah, not so bad at all, mate. Not so bad at all. Very interesting weekend of football, has to be said, mate. <laughs> uh, well, it has, yeah. I mean, the the foot maybe it's not the football so much, but the um, it's what's Lack been it. going on off the field. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's been the big talking point, isn't it? So, absolutely, absolutely. never a dull moment in this uh, Premier League season, mate. God for sure, no. you know, God, we've got plenty to talk about. So, without further ado, let's get stuck into the club corner. A good one for you, and not so much for me, mate. So, let's get going. Okay, club corner time now, and uh, for once, you're going to go first this week, mate. I've hogged the limelight far too much over the last couple of episodes, so uh, up the villa, away we go. Tell us a bit about the game. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it seems strange to actually um, have our game go first this week, isn't it? It's, um, <laughs> But no, it was, uh, we we sort of, we set up um, this week, there was one change to the team, um, so Matty Cash coming back in after his suspension, and um Elmer Howard, he dropped down to the bench. Other than that, we were we were unchanged, um, and I kind of hope that the the sort of the the finish um, against West Brom would would spur us on a little bit. Um, and you know, for once, we we sort of we came out of, of, of the traps pretty well. We we looked sharp um, right from the off. We we, we pressured and. And sort of put Everton on the back foot a little bit. Passing was more positive than it than it has been recently. Um, it was much crisper. Um, we looked like we wanted to win the game um, straight from the off, and kind of mirrored the way that we started against West Brom, um, but then completely switched off once they got the penalty. And but this time it was, you know, it was Watkins' hard work and determination and strength that that won him. You know. Got us the first goal. He won the ball back from from Mason Holgate, who um, really I don't think against Villa he's ever really recovered from that stare that that Jed Steer gave him in the in the playoffs before the before the first penalty. Um, but you know he, he lost the ball and and Watkins managed to you know shrug him off, stay on, stay pretty much on his feet. I mean he was practically on the floor at one point um, before sort of calmly slotting the ball under under Pickford. And that was kind of the the tone of the half. We switched off from a corner, um, which which let Everton back into it, and that was really really frustrating because you you sort of watch it again, and and you follow Barkley who who was marking Calvert Lewin, who I'm, I'm still not sure why um, he was on him, but he he had him sort of grappled at one point, and then completely lost him, um, and he you know Calvert Lewin at the back post with isn't going to miss from that range. But that didn't put us down this week. Um, last week against sort of West Brom, when, when we conceded a goal, we just looked flat. We, we looked like we'd lost our confidence this week. It, it seemed to spur us back on again. And, you know, we had chance after chance in that first half and, and Pickford played so well as well. You know, he, he, he some crucial saves from, from Watkins and, and Traore as well. And we, we really looked like we would... We would get another two or three, and I think again that was really frustrating that we weren't able to to take our chances in that first half, despite despite the dominance of sort of possession and, and the amount of chances that we had. Um, I say we Watkins had a, a couple that he should really have done better with. Um, Bogley hits the post. Um, Traore, uh, Traore had one that was you know saved by Pickford, and then the follow up he, he, he tipped around the the post as well. El Ghazi hit the bar and it, and it looked sort of almost one way traffic and you wondered whether that, that lack of a second goal would come back to, to haunt us in the second half. And Everton were, were better second half and, and, and had a few more chances. Um, I think there was a, actually a chance in the first half that, that Calvert-Lewin had where he headed it sort of straight at Martinez that Martinez did well to to sort of keep out, 
But then second half, you know, Richarlison came more into the game and had a couple of opportunities, but sort of put those wide. Um, and yeah, it was it's sort of the game dragging on. He thought we, we've kind of lost our chance here, but we still looked positive. We still looked like we were trying to to do things to to try and win us the game. And then it the sort of the winner came from um, I think Everton gave the ball away down our right hand side and little sort of crisp into Patterson between I think it was McGinn um, and then the ball ended up with Traore. He cut inside and, and, and played a nice little ball across to, to El Ghazi. He cut inside the defender and curled one past past Pickford, who, who really didn't have any chance with it. Uh, and that was it. And, you know, El Ghazi strikes again. <laughs> um, that's his, it's his eighth goal now this season. And, you know, his, his form is a little bit patchy. But, you know, when he's on form, he, he, he does score. He does find the net. And, Hopefully that can can carry on now until the end of the season. And it was nice to to see the team with it with a little bit of mojo back. That you know it, it looked like they'd had the shackles taken off them, and and Smith had allowed them just to kind of go out and just play. Barkley looked much better. You know he, he worked hard. Uh, you know apart from the the corner where he he lost um, Calvert Lewin. You know he put the effort in. He was he tracked. He you know there were a couple of of moments where sort of things bypassed him, but in all, he he was far far better than he than he has been for weeks. And I've been really critical of him in, in the last couple of weeks, couple of months. And I think he was, you know, he was unlucky. He was creating opportunities for others. You know, he, he made that opportunity for himself in the first half where he, he hits the post, and it was really good to see. Um, and it was, you know, it was a nice little bounce back and and. We, you know, we go back into the top half of the table again and hopefully it's a, like I say, it's just a little bit of a, a confidence boost to take into the rest of the season. Absolutely. I think with Ross Barkley, it was interesting because yeah, he, he did look a lot better. I wonder whether that was to do with the opposition, potentially, you know, going back to his, his you know, his club that he started at and everything, he might have had a bit of a, you know, a bit of his, uh, you know, his, his kind of chest out, ready to go and, and show everybody what they were missing. But yeah, he did look a lot better, mate. I think you, you played some good stuff. Everton have so Jekyll and Hyde this season. We've said it how many times now? You look, you look at the team and you think, you know, they've got a Champions League winning manager. They've got some great players, but they just can't seem to string it together. I'm very interested to see what Ancelotti does with that squad in the summer, because I think you add three or four real quality players in that team, then they've got a chance. But at the minute, they just don't seem to have enough to they? stay in games. It's, but I think a little bit of experience will come with it. You know, they've mm. they've kind of jumped up by level this season, and they started so well. Um, you know, you look at the start of the season, and they were flying, and a little bit like us in a sense that you kind of almost were waiting for the bubble to burst a little bit and them to to kind of find their level. And and I think that's happened. Um, but they've got some real positives to take forward and, you know, a little bit, again, like us, you, you have a good summer of, of strengthening that squad and and they can be, be real sort of challenges for that top six, top four maybe next season. You know, they, they've got the manager in place. They've got a good squad there at the moment, but if they can add to that, then, you know, they, they, they're going to be they're going to be flying again and hopefully we'll be doing the same that's got to be the plan, I think, for both your sides, really, in the next level for Villa, is to obviously get into that top seven, you know, probably to start with. If top four is there, great, you know, and obviously Everton the same, you know, they've got a new stadium coming, Champions League winning managers, we've already said, you know, some quality in there with Hammers and, you know, Calvert Lewin and a couple of other guys, you know, so I think for those two clubs, a very transitional summer, you know, I think in terms of, you know, not an overhaul, like you mentioned in the last podcast, just a few key areas of addition for the Villa and obviously for Everton, maybe another two or three more, you know, and I think both those sides will definitely threaten the top the top six next season. I, I think I'd like to think so. Um, you, you're absolutely right in sort of the key areas. I, I don't think, you know, we, we went through a couple of major overhauls and, and last season especially, you know, coming into the Premier League this season, we added those key key players, and it and it's made us far better. If we can do that again, um, you know, strength in depth now, and some of the players that we're being linked to will give us much more of a chance to maintain that that push that we that we started this season, but just couldn't couldn't keep up. 
you know, with with injury, with with the COVID break that we had, and obviously with Jack being missing, and I think this is the that's the first time I've mentioned him in the in sort of ten minutes, and normally <laughs> it's the it's the case, of, you know, ten seconds noticeable. <laughs> yeah, normally you, it's the first thing you kind of go well, you know, it's another game where we haven't had him. Mm. Actually, for once, it didn't look like we really missed him. You know, yes, he would have made a huge difference, but I think we played so well this time you know we weren't perfect it, it, far from it but we were so much better this this week than than sort of previous weeks that it was the first time we kind of felt actually we we do have a shot without him it's not just a complete one-man team and we're not so reliant on him if the others can you know put in a performance like El Ghazi did um like Traore did he looked much better this week um McGinn looked sort of fresh and able to to play a little bit more freely and you know Louise was you know didn't give the ball away quite as much as he has done in previous weeks and everything just looked so much better and I think it was a little bit of freedom that they've been given that just that just helped so yeah I think we're we're still waiting for for the main man to come back but there's a little bit more positivity about the about the place now Absolutely. And listen, Aston Villa fans, if any of you are listening at all, you know, uh, like the video, subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know if you agree with what Mark's saying. And obviously Everton fans as well. Let us know your thoughts. You know, it's kind of up and down this season. Results you really should have started to win, uh, you know, to turn that corner. But fingers crossed next season, you've got you've got plenty in the locker. Great manager, you know, a bit of investment and, you, and you'll kick on. So from the good result for your team to an absolutely shite result, for my team. Moving on to Newcastle United, who sadly reverted back to type this week after a couple of seasons in the day, well, sorry, a couple of uh, games in the dizzy heights of winning and drawing games. So, uh, so lo looking at how we lined up at St James's Park, we made one key change, uh, one we were all very excited about, and that was the main man, Callum Wilson, starting the game. You know, we mentioned in the last podcast, he's looked progressively sharper as he came in, he started the game. It was nice to see young Matty Longstaff and Ellie Addison on the bench as well. Uh, but sadly, as we all know, Steve Bruce gives them zero game time. So they're just sitting there watching the game like a fan, to be honest with you. So kind of looking at the game as it is in isolation, I'm getting really pissed off with with Steve Bruce and Newcastle United in general, really, because they were playing with the flip-flops on so much, I could hear them slapping down in North Shields from St. James's Park. It was, it was horrendous. I mean... This game should have been a game we should have targeted for a win. You know, we're talking about probably the weakest Arsenal team we've ever known in our lifetime. And not only that, the manager made eight changes because all he cared about was the return leg in Europe this Thursday, which is more important to them than this Premier League game. So most managers would have said to the team, come on, let's get stuck into this lot. They don't fancy it. They made eight changes. They're more interested in the game in midweek. Let's, let's go out there and let's guarantee our Premier League safety. We saw none of that. We saw no effort, no desire, no fight. And the players looked absolutely shattered, dead on their feet. And you think, this is a team that's barely broke sweat all season. They spent most of the season in a relegation fight, not fighting. And all of a sudden, a couple of good results, and they're knackered. You know? and, and it doesn't surprise me that the one player who's capable of coming off the bench and getting a point for us was the one player we couldn't fucking play, which was Joe Willock, because we were playing against his team. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I don't know if you saw the, the video of him on social media or on Sky. He was in the crowd and he was yawning. That's how shit the game was. The lad <laughs> was yawning, right? You know, as we were all yawning because the game was completely boring. So looking at key key elements of the game, you know, six minutes in, you know, typical Newcastle United, Arsenal totally unchallenged, no pressure on the ball, cross comes in, it, it finds um, El, El Many on the edge of the box, John Joe Shelby fucked off to Greg's on Northumberland Street for a sausage roll or something. He's nowhere near the player. Sean Longstaff doesn't have a scooby do where he is. He's got his back to him. He turns around. He hits it. One criticism with Dubravka. He should have stopped it. Otherwise, a bit of a weak shot. And obviously, he lets it in. And we're 1-0 down. And you think to yourself, how did that happen? This Arsenal team, no real stars in it. You know, the rest had Saka, the rest had Lacazette. You know, Aubameyang's just come back from a fucking dose of malaria, you know, and he was still running rings around our defence, you know, which was incredible. So, game kind of goes on. We've got nothing from anybody. 
St. Maximum's trying, but they've got them completely marked out the game. Wilson's not getting a sniff. Uh, Miggy Almiron looked absolutely terrible. He, you know, he looked he looked like more like fucking Mike Almiron from you know Heaven United or something like that. He was dreadful. His touch was shit. His, his movement was shit. He had no idea what he was doing. He should have hooked him off and give one of the young lads a chance, freshen it up, get a bit of extra legs in the team. And he did nothing typical, Bruce. He brought on the same old tired faces, Joe Linton, Dwight Gale. We know what these players can do, and they can't do a lot. So if you're going to have young players on the bench, why not give them a chance? What what more? What what worse could they do than this lot? So game kind of rolls on. We had one shot, which was a deflective scoop effort by Sir Maximum on target. The Matt Ryan had to tip over. Um, Aubameyang pops up with a standard goal against Newcastle, an easy finish. And then to rub salt in the wounds, Fabian Scher gets a bullshit red card, in my opinion. It was a hard yellow at best, in my opinion. Xhaka should have been sent off minutes before that. You know, he had a yellow card early on for fouling, I think it was at maximum. And then he, he totally wipes out Sean Longstaff and gets nothing. So the refs didn't do us any favours, but to be brutally honest with you, the game was dead. Um, a dreadful performance. We're not mathematically safe. So what you got your flip-flops on for, lads? And then you see Steve Bruce's post match comments. And you would have thought we'd we drew the game. So, pff, mate, that's my rant on the game. How <laughs> we were. <laughs> what would you say about that? I think you're right. I think it was just it was one of those that was, and we talked about Villa in, in, in previous weeks just being flat. And it was it was a return to. I think that the last few weeks you've you've had a, a move away from Bruce Ball. This was <laughs> smack bang back into that mould again, and. They just looked. There was no. There was no real effort. Um, there was no desire to to get it at Arsenal and and create opportunities. That I think the only one really, like you said, was was Saint Maximum. That that deflected one. I actually thought it had hit his left foot and deflected up yeah, over the right. Was first. A weird shot, wasn't it? Kind of. You know he, he throws a trick shot or some of the John Virgo trick know. shot that he did or something. <laughs> It was it was bizarre, but you know that was as close as they came. And when you you think of you've brought Wilson back, and he just never never gave him a sniff, never gave him any sort of service to make to try and to make it. it. Just he was starving well that much. He was starving that much. I thought Lenny Henry was going to fucking pop up with a phone number to say, "Please call a donate to Callum Wilson for service." The poor bloke, Jesus man, honestly, it was dreadful. But it was. I, I don't understand. I don't understand how Steve Bruce can look at that and have any positive comments. There was just nothingness in the play, nothingness. Like, you've you got to blame the players to a certain extent because they're professional players, but you can see that, that they've been coached to play that way. That's the more worrying part. They've been coached to play that way. And you think, how the hell is that? Is that still happening? It comes back to that, that conversation we had weeks ago about you need a coach in, in that club to come in. And, and there are some good players in that squad that, you know, they're not mugs. They're not, you know, they're not the old sort of Swindon Town or, or Barnsley or no offence to, to those clubs. But then they're not those teams that came up into the Premier League and were, were sort of whipping boys, were they? they? Newcastle have got some, some star players in that squad. You know, that front sort of group should... Be doing so much better, um, but the, they're just not. It, it just looks at times they're not allowed to. Like I said be a little bit earlier about Villa. You know, it looked like the shackles had come off. They're firmly on. They're not allowed to really accept to maximum. They're not allowed to express themselves, and it, it, it does look like that's the way that they're being coached. Coached to play. Um, you know, the players have to take it on the chin as well because. They're the ones on the pitch, you know. They should have some desire, but when you, you know, you're you centre midfield and it's it's Shelby again, and the game's just in in the main bypassing completely, and he just doesn't. I'm sorry, he just doesn't offer you anything, and no, I don't. It doesn't. It's a waste of a shirt, and he was a captain, no. captain's armband, mate. I mean, what the exactly. fuck is that about? Couldn't run back the bloke, you know. No, and you know you badly missed the ability to to have Willock on the pitch, and you know that was always going to be the case. You can't play against Arsenal, but it's it's telling how much he was missed, even coming on 
as, as a substitute later on in the game just to give you that that spark again that he that he does that he does give you. So it's you know it's another it's another week. Newcastle drop again. You know they're sitting back just above the relegation zone. Now they've got the, the points now, mm. but it's still it's still not completely set. And you know they can't think that they're on the beach. That because if that happens, if if one of the bottom well, the, the you know Fulham or West Brom start, suddenly start to pick up points, and it looks unlikely, mm. but we've seen it. We've seen stranger things happen. Absolutely. You know, I mean, you only go you look at last season. Villa at one point with I think with, with sort of four or five games to go, were seven points behind, and yet they stayed up by the skin of their teeth. And it it mm. happens, so they can't just write it off now. No, I, t- I totally agree with you, mate. I mean, it's, you know, the, the only thing that'll keep Newcastle up this season is the fact that teams below are worse than they are. It, you know, it, there's been no grand design here. There's been no managerial masterclass, you know, or no no, no real outstanding performers either. Yes, at maximum Wilson, you know, Darlow, you know, probably the three main ones I would say this season, but but invariably we'll stay up because the teams below us are worse, you know, and it, it's, it's so depressing as a Newcastle fan. I mean, you know, Sky Sports have been running the entertainers um, <clears throat> I think the last couple of days, you know, the Kevin Keegan years. It's just a, it, it's a reminder to anyone who, ha- who doesn't remember that what Newcastle United can be when the team has got investment, it's got desire, you know, tries, you know, just even even just to put on a show, entertain the fans. You know, this isn't the Newcastle United that we grew up watching, you know, and it's so depressing. I feel so sorry for these young fans having to put up with this shit season after season. You know, Rafa was a nice, gentle break in between the monotony, you know, but it's it's so depressing. It really, really is. And, you know, you, you look you look towards the next couple of games. I mean, our midfield's so pedestrian. I include Sean Longstaff in that as well. He's not the most mobile. Yeah, he grafts hard and he tries, but Shelby's a bad influence on his game. Shelby drags him down to his level. And that's a, if he was next to Isaac Hayden or Willock, I think he would look better. But, you know, we've got Leicester City next. They will run rings around us, mate. You know, it'll be like that Simpsons episode, stop, stop, he's already dead. You know, yeah, I, I'm going to get bad about five or six nil here in the next game. When you look at that midfield for Leicester as well, that, that sort of trio, if, they, if they, they're fit of, you know, and Didi, um, Tielemans and, and Madison, I mean, you, you look at a midfield trio that uh, that Newcastle could put, and there's just no comparison, is there? And No. You want... I think Longstaff, yeah, you're right. He suffers by playing alongside Shelby because it almost feels like at times that he's having to do double the work and he needs somebody alongside him that's going to either take that defensive side away, you know, like Hayden has done, or will be the much more attacking sort of influence in the game and allows him to just sit a little bit deeper and not half and half which which is what's what's really there now the, the sad state of affairs though is you just know shelby will start the next game you know it's i'm pretty sure he's got pictures of steve bruth in a brothel or something like that you know in a compromising position with a lap dancer or something because there's no other way the guy plays week in week out because he offers nothing i mean you know anyone can see any football fan you know please guys in the comments below tell me if i'm, I'm wrong but any football fan can see john joe shelby it's just he offers you nothing. Yeah, he, he may have had that great passing ability seasons gone by, but he's not even got that now. When was the last time you saw him hit a killer ball? Never does no. it anymore. No, you know, I, I haven't even seen it. You see him. this tense? Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't even think we always used to criticize him for, for trying to play too many. I, I, I can't remember seeing many of them at all that even no. attempts at them. It's just that part of his game seems to have been shackled as well. So you know, he, even the even the bit that he could try and do, that looks to have, have been taken away from him. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And people make excuses for him and say, "Oh, he's got no runners." He's got runners now. He's got Saint Maximus. He's got Wilson. He's got Elmeron. So he's got runners in the team, and he's still not playing the passes. So, you know, I think the time to make excuses for John Joe is long gone. I think the guy, the guy needs to go. Um, in my opinion, I think he's, he drags the team down. He's he's preventing young players like Matty Longstaff and Elliot Anderson getting through the ranks and in the first team. You know, I'd much rather see one of those two start against Leicester than him. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, you you kind of want the rest of the season now to be, be a chance for some of those players. And mm. 
it's maybe too soon. I think once you're safe, then then that's maybe the way to go because it could be you could go one or two ways. It could be brilliant by bringing them in, or it, they could freeze, or it could completely crush them, especially in a team that isn't playing well. By bringing somebody into that team, that could that could have the worst uh, you know possible effect on them by completely destroying their confidence and mean that they they then don't go on to to be as potentially as good as they could be very possibly but i think the, the sad reality is they probably won't be as good as they could be as long as this manager ruins their careers on a daily basis in trading probably mate but uh, but you know for now that's us done with the club corner and it's uh, time to move on for the rest of the roundup Okay, so it's weekly roundup time now. Time to look at the uh, domestic action kicking off with the Premier League this week. So we start on Friday night with uh, Southampton versus Leicester with uh, an unbelievable moment, which we'll come on to in a minute. Moving on to Saturday, we had Manchester City beating Palace 2 0, nice and routine. Sergio Aguero reminding us all he's not finished. We had Brighton beating Leeds 2 0, which I never saw coming. Uh, a bad result for Fulham with Chelsea winning 2 0. Uh, spells kind of danger for Scott Parker's men. Uh, we covered Villa and Everton 2 1, but Mark will never get tired of hearing that. Moving on to Sunday. An absolute bag of shite there was Newcastle versus Arsenal. I was getting beat 2-0 very easily. Uh, Manchester United Liverpool didn't happen, if, if anyone didn't know. Uh, we're going to cover that in a lot more detail in the news section. Uh, it's a nice win for Spurs against the dead and buried Sheffield United, 4-0, uh, with Gareth Bale hat-trick, which we're going to come on to in a second. And uh, the games from today, we had West Brom v Wolves, which is 1-1. At the time of starting this recording, we had Burnley versus West Ham. It was 2-1 at the latest, and it did actually finish 2-1 to the Hammers. So that was the Premier League action covered in this week. And just some of the key talking points made, starting off with uh, our new feature, which is uh, What the Fuck of the Week. Uh, and the <laughs> first winner of What the Fuck of the Week goes to VAR and the referee for the ridiculous red card that Vestergaard received Friday night against Leicester. So if you haven't seen everyone, please go on Twitter, look at it, search it. So Vestergaard does what a lot of defenders have been doing recently. Me and Mark covered this in a couple of podcasts ago. Tries to be a bit too cocky, loses control of the ball, thinks, oh shit, what do I do? The Sheffield speedster Jamie Vardy's coming. So he dives in, he gets more than a toe. He probably gets about a third of his foot to the ball, plays the ball, catches Vardy with a follow through, a fucking red card. What the fuck of the week indeed. What do you think about that, mate? Yeah, I think absolutely. It's sort of on the similar lines to the one of from from last week, wasn't it, with Balboa? Mm, the West Ham. Yeah, you know, he, he he plays the ball, and it's it's the fact that his foot just can't stop. It can't go anywhere else. He can't suddenly make it disappear. Vardy's in the way, yes, but it's a clean tackle. He takes the ball. His studs. There's an argument. His studs are slightly up, but. It's the way that he's played the ball. It's not, yes, it doesn't have to be intentional. There's definitely no intent there. It, it's not a dangerous tackle. There's no, there's, there's no malice there. There's, there's no, it's not a dangerous play. It's not, I, I suppose it, it could have been, you know, it could have ended with, with Vardy being injured, but it's just not a red card. It, it's not a yellow card. It's not a foul. It's just, it was a good recovery challenge from a defender who dropped a bollock. You know, fair play to Vestergaard for yeah. getting back and making the challenge. This VAR and, and the referees, they're ruining the game of football. We're a hop, skip and a jump away from no contact. I was just watching a bit of Wolves West Brom earlier. I think the West Brom centre-half gets in trouble and the Wolves attacker nicks, nicks it off him and the, the West Brom player just falls to the ground and they go, oh, free kick. And Nuno went fucking mental, and rightly yeah. so, because he didn't touch the bloke. He got the ball off him because you were being too cocky. You didn't see where he was coming from. But, you know, what's what's happening with the game now? We're going to just be running over hands up, not touching each other, not tackling each other. Yeah, these guys are killing the game, mate. No, it's it's sort of it's all basketball. I mean, even basketball has more physical contact now than than, than football does. It's it's crazy. Yeah. And, and croquet's you know, got more physical contact than football these days, mate. Honestly, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and, and you throw in, if you know, while we're talking about the the challenges and 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 VAR, and you throw in a second, you know, a second what the fuck moment is the Fleck challenge. <laughs> oh uh, my god! The stamp. It's just you go from the ridiculous one where it's not a red card, 
and it's given to one that should be a red card and isn't given because I'm, I'm sorry, but and Sheffield United fans will, will probably disagree with this vehemently, but Fleck had enough time in that challenge with the cells to get his foot away. He could have moved his foot to the side. It catches it. He, he ends up planting and he looks first and he plants he his foot onto his shoulder and it slips down onto the Celso's face. Now, I don't for one second think that Fleck thought that, you know, had any intent to to stamp on on the Celso's face. You know, the the way it looked as if he was trying to dig him in, in the shoulder or something like that, just give him a bit of a yeah. kick. And even that's bad enough. Yeah. Sunday but, league. It was very naughty Sunday yeah, league type it's, challenge, wasn't it's, it? Yeah. It's proper shit housery. And mm. there's there's enough time for him to have got his foot out of the way, and I'm sorry that when that's looked at it for, I don't, I don't understand how it's not given as a as, a, as dangerous play. They looked at it so many times, and it it just it bears belief that, you know, I can understand the referee not you know not catching it and not seeing exactly what's happened, but for VAR to look at it afterwards and just and not think that there's something wrong with that is is just ridiculous. I mean, Brian, Brian Mason was foaming after the game, wasn't he? If you saw him on uh, Match of the Day, he was absolutely furious about it. And fair play, he came straight out and didn't set on the fence. He said, red card, complete red card. I don't know what the hell they were watching. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, no and, and, yeah. and, and there's been so many of those instances where you look at it and VAR, this is what VAR should clear up, that, you know, this is what it was brought in for. And yeah. it's not. It's just... It's, it's just not, and, and it's that argument, it's not VAR. It isn't the system no. that's broken. It's the people that are using it. It is. And they're not I don't think they using understand. it properly. Yeah, they don't understand what a tackle is. I mean, arguably, even the, the, sh the share tackle in the Castle game, it was a hard yellow, you know, a, a hard yellow tackle. It, it, it was it was reckless. It was a bit late. You know, he's just come back from injury, that kind of a thing. Most referees sensibly would say, well, that's a bad tackle, red, you know, not a red card, a yellow card, you know, and then say to him, next one, you're off, you know. But that seems to have gone as well now. It's almost the minute somebody comes in late, and it looks a bit of a ooh, one of them that go off oh, red card. I just think, I think really. I think with with the Shah one, I, I think it's basically that the referee gave it, so VAR backed it up because they couldn't see mm -hmm. a clear and obvious way to to not give it. If it hadn't been a red card, you know, if the referee, if it was a Mike Dean hadn't given the red card, I don't think mm -hmm. VAR would have overturned that and, and made it a red card. But well, because to, he'd to already be... given it, that's that's what the way it stayed. Well, to be fair, you, you did say the words, Mike Dean, I'm a celebrity <laughs> referee there. You know, if you want to be a celebrity, Mike, go and eat crocodile balls over in the fucking Australia on deck. Stop ruining football games to make your name, mate. So keeping with that Spurs game, though, going back to a, a nice talking point, we mentioned it before, a lovely hat-trick from Gareth Bale made some beautiful finishes as well, wasn't it? Harry Kane took a day off, but Bale was on form. Yeah, he, he was, and, you know, we've, we've sort of talked about the... Bale not being the same player that he was, and he, he having those glimpses of, of of that form, and certainly that was was one game where where he's he's sort of back to his best. If if just for ninety minutes, that was it was really nice to see the you know the first finish where he flicks it over um, over the keeper with his with his the outside of his left foot. You know, is beautifully beautifully timed. Um, his second finish that he buries into the top corner um, as he runs that. through. And again, you know, the nice tidy finish again, just sort of from about the edge of the box, and you know, he, he he gives the keeper no chance at all with with really any of them, and you know, even Son's goal at the, sort of the end was 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 a really good finish too, curling that in off the post, and Spurs look look great again. It was they, they sort of had moments like that when you know under Mourinho where they would would have a game where they would would look really good, and then it would sort of settle back into that. You know, just you know, we'll, we'll try and win, but but not give too much away. Yes, this one was against Sheffield United, so it was it was kind of always going to be in the bag, I think, for them. But the the way they they they, they went about the business, and especially Bale, I think he was he was just different class. Absolutely. I mean, you know, in terms of uh, Wales as well, they'll be wanting more and more games they got from them because there's been a bit of a turbulent camp for the Welsh going into this tournament and a fully fit fire in Gareth Bale is uh, is definitely something that they want going into the tournament. So just before we move on to the EFL, just one last talking point, not Premier League related, um, the old firm derby 
um, a real shocker for Celtic. Hammered 4-1 by Rangers. Celtic need massive restructuring, mate, don't they, in the summer? I, th- I do, and I think they're going to, you know, we talked about this a, a couple of weeks ago, that I, th- I think they're going to lose a, a few players in the summer. Mm. Um, you know, you're looking at the likes of Ayer and, and Edward that, that will potentially move on. And yes, that's going to give them a fair amount of cash into the club to be able to then spend on on getting that squad rebuilt and, and challenging Rangers again. But there was a, you know, I, I know Celtic were down to 10 men, but there was a huge gulf in, in performance on uh, on Saturday. It was just it's just huge. You know, Rangers were, were head and shoulders above them. They were absolutely. It's uh, not good for Celtic fans at the moment. You know, nothing worse than seeing the gap widen, widen every week between there, them, them and the guys down the road, mate. So, so we're looking forward to see what happens with that next season. So, so moving away from the Premier League, mate, into the EFL, but a busy schedule, mate. We'll take us through. Yeah. So you know, again, lots and lots of games that um, that, that were going on. We'll we'll start in the Championship as always, and um, we'll bring up the the results, and you know it. Norwich finally sealed the the title, um, obviously with a, a four one win uh, at home to Reading. Um, Brentford um, cemented their third place by by beating second place Watford. Um, it's a comfortable win, I think. Watford had kind of taken their foot off the gas a little bit, and then sort of at the bottom, um, Derby again threw away another lead. Um, they, they keep doing this; they keep getting a, a goal up and, and then throwing it away. They went down 2-1 to Swansea. Um, Swansea go fourth. Uh, Derby now just three points clear of the, t- the three teams below them who are all on, on 40 points now. Um, Rotherham snaps the late draw at home to Blackburn. Uh, Sheffield Wednesday drew 0-0 in the early game um, at Hillsborough against Nottingham Forest. And Wickham beat Bournemouth 1-0 to keep their faint home to survival alive. You know, it's looking... Um, it's looking, you know... They they need huge um, huge amounts of luck um, coming into the, the sort of the last game for them to to sort of have any chances of either. You know they, they they've got a an eleven goal difference between them and Derby, so that that's not going to happen. Um, but you know that the bottom certainly those bottom four are so close together. Um, so yeah, obviously Rotherham go on and, and they play a game in hand on Tuesday against Luton. And then they finish up playing Cardiff. Derby um, play Sheffield Wednesday on the last day. Um, and that could be, depending on other results, that could be winner takes all. You know, so that's gonna be that's gonna be a terrific game at, at the end of the season. Um and then we sort of we move into um move into the other games. Um so you, Birmingham lost 4 0 to, to Cardiff um, with a Harry Wilson hat trick. But he was obviously terrific, you know, some, some good goals Great there, couple of free kicks. Um, in that, um, Coventry beat Huddersfield 3 uh, 1. Luton and Middlesbrough drew 1 1, as did Millwall and Bristol City. Um, Preston beat um, playoff bound Barnsley 2 0, um, and QPR beat Stoke 2 0. So that sort of wraps up, um, wraps up the championship. Uh, I know you wanted a, a quick look at sort of Harry Wilson and, and sort of how he's performed and you know that's his um that's he doubles his, his goal tally for the season to six now so mm. it's um a great it's little player he's got so much potential isn't he? He, he he just he's capable of something out of nothing isn't he and I just wonder a Liverpool a Liverpool completely done with them is he on loan there is it, is it a permanent transfer yeah so I I don't think that you know he's he's not of that standard he is a very, very good player, and I think yeah. we'll see him in the Premier League. But it's that that standard at Liverpool is is, is I think f- too high for him. But you know, there's an argument that there is enough quality in there for him to to certainly be, you know, for the time being at least. He, you know, he might improve more. So I'm not going to write him off completely from from, from playing at, at that higher level. But certainly. That mid to lower sort of Premier League level might be might suit him down to the ground to, to start with. Um, so we'll move into League One, um, and you know we've got uh, sort of Hull um, again. They 
they sealed their title. Um, so obviously Norwich winning the championship with not whole seal in the League One title. They beat Wigan 3-1. It was a result that could have been really dangerous for Wigan, um, as the you know the teams below them could have closed the gap to them. Um, but sort of the, the the two that really mattered, Rochdale um, lost 2-1 to Doncaster and, and Northampton um, really just surrendered meekly and went down 3-0 to, to Blackpool. Uh, and that kept them safe and and sent Rochdale and, and Northampton down. Um, the bottom two, Swindon uh, and Bristol Rovers also lost. Swindon lost 2-1 to Ipswich and Bristol Rovers lost by a, a single goal to Crewe. Um, it was a, an odd um, stat as well that they picked up from that, that the, the bottom eight in League One all lost. Um, so none of them sort of tried to, to kind of gain any ground or, or, or try and, you know, the, certainly the, the two that could have got out of the, the bottom four just that didn't didn't do anything really, you know, to, to try and get out. Um, Wimbledon, who were in that group of eight, um, lost to, to Portsmouth 3-1, Plymouth, um, lost by the same scoreline to Sunderland, um, and Shrewsbury lost 3-2 to Oxford. Um, Sunderland's win put them third, um, and Blackpool just about sealed their playoff place as well with, with their result. Um, Portsmouth and Oxford stay sixth and seventh. Uh, Charlton Athletic lost um, ground on them um, as they only drew 1-1 with Accrington, so they, they've still got a, a game on, on the others, and you know they'll look to sort of close that gap, and that will go back to the the last day of the season. Um, Burton and Gillingham drew 1-1, and um, the same result was between Fleetwood and MK Dons. But the, the game of the day was was sort of at the top. It was um, Peterborough versus Lincoln. Peterborough needed a point to guarantee their promotion, um, but they were 3-0 down after 53 minutes, um, and they staged a, a huge fight back. Um, and they, you know, it was getting late in the game, and sort of you know, anything happens at that point at three-two. And uh, their equaliser came from a penalty after Sammy Schmodix th- threw himself to the floor. There's no other way to say it. It was the worst dive I've, I've seen. Um, it was horrendous. How the referee gives it, it is unbelievable. It was absolutely shocking. Um, but it, it got them the penalty. Um, Clark Harris scored, um, you know, as a result. I think that's his 30th of the season or 31st of the season. So it, it sends Peterborough up. Um, you know, Darren Ferguson, the manager, come out and describe it as his best promotion ever. And so you kind of you agree, given the issues around how the league ended last year with the the missing the playoffs with the when the league was stopped because of the pandemic. It's kind of as he says, it, it, it's been a, a two-season-long promotion push, and I think they were in so such good form um, towards the towards the end, well, before the pandemic sort of stopped stopped play. That they were they were heading into that playoff picture and looking a good bet last season. So it's you know it's it's good to see them get up again. They're a, you know they're a good side. Um, so yeah, congratulations to them. Um, so just quickly, just a, a brief overview. There's the, the the League One table, and then we move into League Two. Obviously, Cheltenham last week um, had sort of guaranteed their you know their promotion already. Um, and we look at obviously their closest challenge at the moment with Cambridge, and they were they played on Friday night. The game was absolutely insane. <laughs> I was say, what a game. It's like a FIFA game, isn't it? It was nuts. Um, Harrogate were three up after 20 minutes. Um, it was 3-2 t- after 29 minutes. Um, three minutes after that, Harrogate scored their fourth to make it 4-2. Um, and then Cambridge battled back and got it to 4-4, uh, but lost it with six minutes left. Um, so they went down f- sort of 5-4. And then move into the Saturday, um, Southend um, won. Um, they beat Barrow 2-1, um, but ended up being relegated um, bit due to, to the results. Um, Scunthorpe drew um, with Bradford, which gave them a point, which which kept them them safe. And, and Colchester won 1-0 over, over Salford, who were chasing the playoffs. 
Um, I'll just bring the, the table up as well and see that. There we go. Um, and the other results, obviously, Bolton missed a chance to go level with Cheltenham. Um, they lost to Exeter. Um, and Fleetwood's win over Tranmere meant that both them and Exeter jumped above both Salford, who'd lost. So it means Cheltenham stay top. Um, and the only team that's confirmed to go up, Cambridge, Bolton and Morecambe are all fighting over second and third. Newport, Tramier, Forest Green, Exeter and Salford are then battling over the, the, those sort of three playoff places below Morecambe. Um, and sort of, you look at the other games, sort of bottom side, Grimsby beat Port Vale, but they were already already relegated. Um, and the final games, Carlisle beat Leighton Orient 3-2. Um, Mansfield um, thumped Oldham 4-1 and Stevenage and, and Crawley drew 3-3. So there's loads and loads of goals in, in the AFL this week. And, mm. you know, the, there's some some tasty results, some some odd decisions, like I say, with the, the Schmodex dive and, and the Peterborough's point. But, you know, big congratulations to Norwich for their title, to Hull to the, for their title, um, for Peterborough for, for their promotion. And, you know, the last day of the season, is looking like it's going to be really tasty with with stuff going on in, in sort of all three divisions. So it's good to be, be good to keep an eye on. Absolutely, and fingers crossed. You know, by the time the players come round, the, the fans will actually be able to get to the games. And I know they've had a couple of trials recently, and you know, I'm, I'm crossing the fingers that the supporters of those clubs can get there. You know, because the support is fanatical in those leagues. It is that you know they they're, they're great. You know, I was listening to somebody talking about. Um, but it's sort of Wednesday potentially dropping into League One, and much as he doesn't want want didn't want it to happen, that he was looking forward to some brilliant away days because some of the some of the the places you go to, you know, there's little, little, smaller stadiums, but the support is absolutely outstanding, and you know they're, they're great teams. And we go back to this conversation we had last week again about protecting the pyramid, and it's what it's all about. You look at the the, the passion of the fans there, and you know the determination of players to, to, to you know to get points and, and put performances on, and you know the, the AFL is a, a great, you know a great sort of head of the the pyramid is you know as, as teams are battling to to get higher up and get into the Premier League. So you know we'll look forward to next week. You know the that last day, especially that that Wednesday derby game, looks to be. Um, want to really really watch because that could be really fiery absolutely if i was waiting really, i get my boots back on mate i might actually win the game <laughs> <laughs> you never know right for now we're going to leave the efl it's time to move on have a look at the uh, european results and, and upcoming uh, legs this week okay so now it's time to have a look at the european fixtures and the results from the last week so we kicked off on tuesday in the champions league where uh, chelsea traveled to um, real madrid not the bernabeu the alfredo de stefano stadium and uh, they got a nice one one draw with pulisic scoring and benzema equalizing for madrid and then wednesday we had a great result for man city beating psg 2-1 and it was lovely to see neymar looking miserable as fuck to be honest with you mate. <laughs> I, did, I did quite enjoy that but uh, a cracking result for city mate wasn't it yeah, absolutely. You know, they you know they, they went down um to a Marquinhos goal, didn't they? To um it was a header. Um it was, yeah. and then they came back really well, you know, they, they came out of that, that sort of the second half and and really dominated that that second period and, and were really well deserving of, of, of going away with the with the win and you know it sort of sets that up brilliantly for them in the in the second leg now. Well, I must admit, the PSG war was about as strong as Donald Trump's, I think, when that free kick came in for Mahrez, oh. unfortunately. So uh, it was a bit of a shit uh, shit attempt to block that free kick, but a great result for City, mate. And you'd back them to do it at the Etihad, wouldn't you? They've got to go through with the final, haven't they? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, you're not going to write PSG off. You know, the players that they've got, um, you know, in that certainly in that attacking sort of area and Bappe who, who looked so so quiet um mm. he was not fit, not fit I think, not, no, no I, I I always said that you know he's it was almost Harry Kane like um you know in the in the cup final and, and in the Champions League final where he's he's been rushed back to to play in such an important game but he was almost a passenger at times he just didn't look right um so yeah he, 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 
Don't they've sorry. got the players too, mate. They've got the players, mate. They've got the players to rest him as well. You know, they've got a great squad. You know, so don't risk the lad. You know, let them no, play the I, second leg. It, it, I mean, it is a huge game. You know, they, they're going up against against the, the favourites, I think. And you understand why you want your, your big players in, in that game. But he, he didn't look right. Um, maybe bringing him in off the bench for half an hour towards the end, you know, get yourself through to that point and keep it tight is, is the kind of had done and then bring him on to, you know, have a 30 minute run out, get a little bit more sort of game time and, and, and sort of match fitness and just don't try and run him into the ground. Cause that, that could backfire on him. And, mm, you know, it, has that, has that set the sort of set the scene for the, for the second leg now where because City are two one up, because they've got those those two way goals that that just makes it it's so much more difficult for PSG and, and puts them out. Um, you know, like I said, I'm not gonna write them off, but you you certainly back City now. Yeah, definitely, 100%. And, and it was a great result for uh, Chelsea probably as well over there, I think, mate. You know, 1-1's not disgraceful at all. You know, two goals show that they're very frugal, you know, when it comes to <laughs> conceding chances. And I would probably I put it back Chelsea at the bridge, but with Real Madrid, they're so experienced in Europe. You just again, it's just too close to call, isn't it? It is. I thought Chelsea were brilliant. Um, sitting that that first period, they they had sort of several chances where they could have could have been further ahead. Um, Benzema's goal was was fantastic as a, brilliant. as a as an equaliser. But and you're right, they they have so much experience in those big games that. You know, you, you just don't write them off, even when they're, you know, they've, they've not been quite at their, their normal selves. And they they came through that group stage and, and they looked they looked awful at times, but they just hit, you know, form at the right time in, in, in the competition. And, you know, even with Chelsea having a away goal and, and it being so tight, you you can't, it's, it's too, too close to call. Um, going into that second leg, so it's uh, it's going to be a fascinating one to watch. I bet your Chelsea fans in the back of their mind they were thinking, "Jesus, please, Hazard, do not score and put us out of this competition." <laughs> yeah. just, you could, the, the, the nightmare he's had at Real Madrid, you could just see him popping up with that bloody goal, couldn't you? And putting them out, mate. So, so fingers crossed. You know, we'll have an all English final in the Champions League. Moving on to um, Europa Cup action as well, mate. Tell us a little bit what happened there. Some goals and that. Yeah. So, um, I mean the. He, Sort of on on Thursday night, Manchester United were were playing Roma. Um, you know, Roma at half time were, were winning two one. Um, with their goals through Pellegrini and Jacko. But United sort of stormed back second half and and, and won the game six two. And you know they've I can't can't any any way see that they're gonna gonna throw this away. There's two goals from Fernandez, two from Cavani. Um, one from Pogba and one from Greenwood, and that and that sets them up nicely for the second leg, just to to kind of um, just to to walk in into the final. Yeah, the other one is a little bit more finely balanced. Um, you know, VRL one two one um, on the night goals from Munoz and, and Albiol. But again, you know, second half was was a different story. You know, Villarreal had dominated that that opening period, but but Arsenal came back in the second half and and looked much much better. Um, and you know, Pepe's penalty to to get them back to two one, it gives them a vital goal to to take into to the second leg. And you know, they it's, they they've looked so much better in Europe than they have in, in the in the Premier League as well, haven't they, Arsenal? So. Yeah. They'll, they'll fancy their chances now with, with only a goal difference. You know, two nil that the, the second leg is a is a completely different story because all it takes is one one away goal and, and, and suddenly that tie changes. Because Arsenal have it, 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 it doesn't make it easier, but it, it certainly makes the the challenge a lot easier. The, the, the trying to to sort of win, you know, one nil or, or or if they can get two, then. Just makes things a lot, a lot more simple for them, and hopefully, we'll see, a, we'll see another All English final again in, in in the Europa League. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I mean, the problem is with Arsenal; you just don't know Arsenal's going to show up. Do you? Is the is the thing? You know, I mean, it's um, 
if they were on form and firing, you'd expect them uh, to do it, you know, uh, at the Emirates. But they're so flaky at times, you know. And I mean, my money's still on Villarreal. I think they've got the experience in Europe. I think they'll, I think they'll do enough to get through that that second leg. And there was an interesting stat that if Mikel Arteta doesn't win the Europa League, it's the first time that I think Arsenal won't be in Europe for 25 years. That's really damning for him as the Arsenal manager, to be honest with you. People can talk about time and, you know, the Cronkies and everything else. But if Europe aren't, if, sorry, if Arsenal aren't in Europe for tw- the first time in 25 years, that is not good. No, it's damning on the club, I think. You know, yeah. it's not just Arteta. It is It is the whole the whole club um, right from, from the very top. You know, you, we've seen Arsenal protests against the, the Cronkies and, you know, the potential of, of the guy from um, from Spotify wanting to, to buy the club and things, so we'll see see what goes on with that. But be interesting. Thierry Henry was yeah, Thierry Henry was talking about that on Sky tonight as well yeah. on Monday Night Football. So very very interesting, mate. But yeah, I mean, Arsenal fans will be hoping that goes ahead. You know, and, you know, I'd love to see an All English final in the in the Europa League as well. But I'm just not confident that Arsenal have got it in them to go through, mate. Despite wiping their arse comfortably with us uh, at the weekend, which is very hard, <laughs> you know. But uh, I just don't think that they've got it in them to get through there. But you know, we'll watch on with interest and, and we'll see what happens. So, so for now, we're, we're leaving Europe, <laughs> much like Brexit, but not forever. And uh, we're going to move on to uh, what's in the news. Okay, so it's time for our What's in the News section. And uh, much like podcasts previous, there's only one story that really dominates this, and that's probably going to take up the whole news story section. So while Sky were getting ready for another Super Sunday and they're watching Newcastle be utterly shit against Arsenal, um, the next game was arguably the biggest fixture in the Premier League calendar, which was Manchester United versus Liverpool. Now, story started to break early that um, there was protests outside the ground, much like Chelsea fans did the week before. Uh, peaceful protests, we must say. Um, but then there was news coming out that some fans started to find their way to the ground and Sky ran the cameras and the, you know there was there was fans breaking into the ground, getting onto the pitch. By and large, it was all peaceful, um, but there was some stories about flares being thrown, as you can see in the images, mm-hmm. uh, the, you know, cans of lager being thrown. Uh, there's an image going around social media of, of, of a police officer with a slash to his face. You know, now we don't know how that happened, but... You know, I think the, it's very important here to say that Manchester United fans have got every right to protest. I think as any human being has, any football fan has. But wherever you find activists, there'll always be anarchists. There'll always be people that find their way into the crowd that have a different agenda to everybody else. And I think, you know, we shouldn't lambast the Manchester United fans as a mass for this. There's a small minority here that I think have spoiled it for everybody else. What would you say, mate? Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that there's nothing wrong with with a protest we've seen how good protests can be recently you've, you've only got to look at the, the the protest outside Stamford Bridge um you know after the the Super League was was announced and, and see how peaceful and and well done that that was and that was that was fans of, of Chelsea and, and others as well and it was it was it was peaceful it was good humored despite the you know the hatred of, of what was going on, and this was a little bit different. There was there was that element of, of people who were were purely there to, to protest against the Glazers and about what's gone on. And I think, you know, that this isn't new. You know, it's it's been going on a long time. Um, you, you go back ten years or so, and you you look at the the formation of a of a new club. Um, you know, you've got the green and gold sort of um, protest that that went on, and I, I know um, Jamie Carragher was talking about that earlier on on, on Sky as well. And, and and this is this isn't just a, a, as a result of the Super League. I think that has kicked this into gear a little bit more. It's a tipping point, isn't it? It's been a tipping point, yeah, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So you know. It, and, and you're right. Wherever there's an element of, of, of sensible protest, and, and we saw a lot of of it, there's always the idiots um, and the ones that will will ruin the message. And breaking into the ground is you can't you can't condone any of that. And even though, though a lot of that was peaceful, they shouldn't have been there. You know, it, yeah. it was if they've broken in, it's criminal damage. If they, you know, they're on the pit, it's trespassing. 
they were there were flares being thrown towards the stand there were bottles um like they say cans and things that were being thrown as well there were people injured so yes protest there is nothing wrong with 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 a proper protest and, and, and doing it the right way what happened on on sunday was was a bit of both and and we we applaud the ones that were protesting the right way because you know that you need to have your voice heard and, and it's and it's it's a good way of doing that and we've seen it done well but you have to you have to draw the line and the idiots that that were involved and, and, and went the wrong way with this um have sort of hijacked the message almost and and that's been more of the talking point rather than the the actual the actual proper protest itself no i think yeah i think you're right you know uh, well, surprisingly, really, for all of us, um, they said the match was going to be delayed. And we thought, well, you know, it might be a half five kickoff or, or even six o'clock at the latest. And then a complete unthinkable happened. The, the game was completely abandoned. Now, you know, you've got to say to the Manchester United fans, if you're going to make an impact, what a way to pick. Arguably one of the biggest games this country knows. It, it's, it's been around the world, you know, to every corner of the globe. The, there would have been fans in Singapore and America and Africa and you name it, sitting waiting to watch Manchester United versus Liverpool and it hasn't happened. So the message that those fans want to get across is now reverberated across the world and it's not something that the Glazers can ignore. You know, it, it, this is going to affect them and they are going to have to try to answer this and, you know, they, they will have to come out with statements and they will have to try and get the fans on board. But I think those days are long gone. I don't think Manchester United are going to settle for anything other and these guys selling up and going easier said than done, but you know I think mm. they they are going to be pushed into a bit of a corner here, aren't they? They are. Uh, I'm torn a little bit. I I, I completely agree with the, the sentiment of the protest. I I don't agree with with holding the game. I, I think that's mm. there's a line there that that must I have been a safe reason, though, mate. You know, threat to the players, something that had to be something like that. I think there was there was issues with. Um, with getting the teams to the ground, yeah. um, obviously that you know from the the team hotels, whether that was the the Liverpool, and we know how how bad it can be for for teams getting through through fans on normal <laughs> days, and general, especially yeah. with the with the sort of the hatred between United and Liverpool that it, that could have been really really um, dangerous. You know, we saw that that potentially there were a few injuries that came about the protest and at some point it has to be the safety of everybody the players the the staff um the police the the officials everybody that you know even the the people outside the ground and, and the ones inside the ground you've got to you've got to make sure everybody's safe at the end and you know, the right decision to, to to postpone the game yeah, it's it, it's not one you ever want to see. You don't want to see a, a game stop because of it. Hmm. But yeah, like I said, I I agree with the sentiment behind it because you don't want if you know if you want to protest you, the the running of your club, and we've seen it plenty of times in the Premier League with with, with places, and you you want to you want to go about this the right way and make sure that. You get your message across, and and that that can't be ignored. And you're right. This, you know, it's the most high-profile game we're going to get in the in the league, and they've they've had their message heard loud and clear. Whether that makes any difference whatsoever to the Glazers, I'm not convinced it will. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, time certainly will tell, and, and it's very important that you know make this very clear that both Mark and myself are in full agreement that Manchester United fans are completely within their rights to do this. The way the Glazers have treated that club, like a cash cow, you know, like a teat that milked Red Raw, you know, you can talk about spending money on players and everything else, but they don't have the best interest of the club or the community at heart. That's pretty clear, and I think the ESL was a prime example of just the vulgarity that these guys possess and, and the fact that they don't see Manchester United as a club or a community. However, that being said, there was one thing that really fucked me off massively with this whole scenario, and that was Sky's reaction to it. Now, there was a mixed bag of, of personnel in the studio at the time. There was Dave Jones, which we'll come on to in a minute. I know you want to talk about Dave Jones. There was Gary Neville, <clears throat> Jamie Carragher, Graham Souness, and Mika Richards, and Roy Keane as well. So they were all talking about 
you know, do you think the fans are well within their rights and everything else? And they use words like, oh, yeah, they've had enough, you know, the, 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 this is this, they've got no other choice, this and that and everything else. And as a Newcastle fan, it really annoyed me because when Newcastle protested, much more peaceful than this, I might add, against our ownership, and, and, and that, you know, you got some images there, you know, putting pitches outside the grounds by, I think, by war flags, Gallagher flags, and fantastic you know, fan movements that, that, that they do. When we protest the guy against Mike Ashley, we're ridiculed for it. You know, they look at us like, we're, well, what are, you, what are you complaining about? What are you talking about? You know, and then they then start to give us a lecture on Mike Ashley's business acumen and how we should all fall at his feet and ask for stock tip advice. You know, and that really pisses me off because the way they made such a massive statement about this Manchester United um, protest which was in very much a similar context to Newcastle fans and West Ham fans as well. You know, I saw them on social media. They were lambasted for for protesting against, you know, Gordon Sullivan, uh, you know, and, and what they did, with, you know, with the, the London Stadium and everything else. And, you know, they were painted up like hooligans from Green Street or Football Factory or something. And the problem I have with people like Sky, it's the rank hypocrisy that these guys talk about. We've talked about shit pundits. You did a great piece on the blog. If you haven't checked it out, guys, you know, go to the blog link and the you know the address above and check it out. But they've got to they, they've got to have impartiality here. You can't just get on your high horse, Gary Neville, because you played for this club and this club's in your blood. You know, you, you, you've got to look at other clubs as well and give them their time and give them their respect to have their own opinion about their owners as well. No, you're, you're absolutely right. You know. You, you saw the the reaction to to the Newcastle protests recently. Um, they were they were ridiculed, as you say. You know, they were they were Rio Ferdinand's comments about you know if you if you want to you know to to put your hand in your pocket and buy the club essentially. Um, Ridiculous. You know, I I know there's the the social media blackout, so we're not going to see sort of sort of comments from from some of the players because they're they're not gonna uh, you know get on board just yet we'll, we'll obviously see what happens tomorrow mm. um but there's been there's none of those comments none of the none of them have, have come out and and criticized the the protest against the glazers yes they've criticized the the manner in which they that some of them have done it but you look at the the protest that, that, that you mentioned West Ham before. You know it wasn't that wasn't violent. It, you know they didn't break into the ground. They protested no. while they were were in the ground anyway. Exactly. Um, yeah. Newcastle fans have protested in and outside of the ground. They've they, they tried to organise walkouts. Um, you know I, I don't remember. Again, when you look at you look back for when Liverpool were were owned. Um, before and FSG, yeah. Hicks and Gillette, Liverpool yeah. protested a- against them, and they weren't ridiculed. You know, they were backed, and and they got rid of their owners, and and they got mm. they got FSG in, and so you can't you can't have one rule for for one, and and just go to the rest of the well. You know, you've got owners like it or lump it, basically, and it's it is hypocrisy. Um, mm. Absolutely, and, and I think. You know, I, I I understand the fear certainly from Neville because he's you know he's so ingrained in that club. You know, he's he's a United lad and he is watched as the Glazers of, and they haven't ripped the the club apart, but they're not the club that we remember. You know, they are pulling money out of the club at every opportunity, which is their right. They own it, so. It's difficult to to criticise a, a business person to to pull money out where they've they they've made it, but there's no love for that area. There's no love for the for the tradition of Manchester United. There's no love mm. for the club, the fans, the heritage. Nothing. They they are in it for one reason and one reason only, and that's money. The same reason a lot of owners are in it. But we go back to that point we said before: is you can't criticise one group of fans for protesting against an owner that is showing lack of ambition and, and doing things wrong, and then not criticise another set of supporters for doing exactly the same thing. It is just hypocritical, and mm. it's right across Sky, BT, um, 
every other media outlet yeah, every, that talk, talks about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, people tend to forget about this, and I think it's all been very clouded by you know the the, the kind of European Super League um, fiasco that Sky, you know, were absolutely brilliant. The pundit was, was was second second to none, but you know, th there's a top four bias certainly in that organisation, and that always has been. You know, they see the rest of us as we should be lucky we're in the Premier League. We should be thankful that we're in the Premier League. You know, if that had been Newcastle fans or Aston Villa fans or West Ham fans, you know, West Brom fans or whatever, they'd be saying, well, what do you want? You know, you're in the Premier League. You know, you're finishing here and there. You're staying in the league. You know, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have attacked the owners with such ferocity like they have done, you know, the, the Liverpool owners, the Manchester United owners, you know, Sky Sports and guys like that, they definitely are top four elitists, you know, and they need to look at the whole league, you know, practicality. I'll give Sky their due that they're not as bad as BT. BT are fucking horrendous. You know, you've got, I mean, so the fact that these clowns are employed by that organisation, Rio Ferdinand, who's the most impartial, unimpartial fucking pundit I've ever met in my life, Robbie Savage. I mean, these guys are wankers. You wouldn't even listen to them in the pub, let alone on the TV. And that's exactly why football fans have had enough of that and they're you know they're listening to fan-led media you know they're yeah. listening to us talking shit now they're listening to true faith they're listening to the gallagher shots you know they're listening to all you know the aston villa podcast they're listening to all their own fans talk sense about the game and we run our teams down even more than anybody else does because you know we're, we're impartial you know if we're shit we'll say we're shit if we're good we'll say we're good if another team was better will say they're better. You don't get that on these these ridiculously expensive subscribe channels that, to be quite honest with you, are second rate right now. And I, I, I don't think they represent the football pyramid as a mass, mate. I think they just look at the top. No, you're right. And it's it's difficult, isn't it? You know, you, there are some some good ones that are on, on some of those channels. You know, you, you talk about BT and the the impartiality that you get from somebody like Jay Humphrey that I know yeah, he's people brilliant. don't yeah. like, but he he gets it. Certainly when you talk about Newcastle, he mm. he gets where the fans are, and you know he he's he was you know he's quick to to kind of have that comment ag against what Rio was was talking about, and there are others, but you get so many that are that are biased towards either their club or, or or that top order and and i sort of understand to a point because it's it's their biggest money grabber is sky and certainly if they're not going to start completely slagging off members of the top four because does that start start hurting their their bottom line basically but mm. you you're a, you're a news organization at the end of the, the day you, you provide the entertainment for with the football but around that you you provide and comment and and that has to be impartial it has to be you know you yes have have players on that are, that you know from from either side and, and they do that well at times but you you can't have a group of people on on your shows that will rip into one club and just let others go for for the sake that we said this before you know we said this before you, you can't have a go at, at Newcastle fans or West Ham fans or whoever, and then when you have it for United or, or Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal, Manchester City, that's unlikely at the moment, but you get the, the point. You, any of those clubs, that if they were protesting, you can't then back those up and, and rip to shreds the other ones that have dared to, dared to want a little bit of ambition from, from their club because... We come back to the ones that we, we know Newcastle Newcastle fans want is is a little bit of ambition from their club. They Absolutely. want to know where they're heading. They want they want yes, they want better. Who but doesn't? To, to as a football fan. Well, exactly. But to trot out those tired lines time and time again about oh Newcastle fans just want to be in the Champions League again and no, they want an owner and they want a manager and a team to show some ambition. Um and start to get, you know, a little bit further up the league, you know the. And and what United fans want is is they want an owner, to to run the club, with, the thought of, ambition and, um, 
and to to progress and to 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 sort of take take you know take the heritage of the club and the fans on board and and just listen to them and that's something that the Glazers haven't done at United. You know, they've they've very rarely, if at all, interacted with the fans. Um, and like you said, every football fan wants their team to have ambition. And it's just, it's sad when you you sit here and we we have a, we have to to kind of have a go at, at an organisation that does show that level. And I use the word for a third time that level of hypocrisy to to you know to back one set of fans in in their protest and but to have not that long ago sat there and and, and had a go at another group of fans for really showing that that same you know that same level of, of protest against against their own absolutely it's it it is it's rank hypocrisy it's the same you know when you talk about like to talk sport and, and people like that as well but you know what really infuriates me about sky is you know I say Sky because they're probably the biggest media out there, but they've got the resources, they've got the personnel. They can research on how Newcastle are playing, how Aston Villa are playing. You know, what what are our stats in the possession guide? You know, me and you are just two normal lads doing a podcast. We can go and get that stat and we can, we can talk about that stat in detail. You know, we know because we watch Aston Villa and Newcastle, we can week out and we know exactly how they play. But spend a bit of time engaging with supporters, you know, talk to the Newcastle United Supporters Trust, get them on Sky Sports News, get their opinions and views and find out why they're so pissed off. Don't just make a sweeping statement like, you know, Paul Merson did a good few months ago, where he, he still thinks we think we've got Shearer and Ginola playing for us. I mean, it, it's so tired and lazy and disrespectful to the rest of the team teams in that division that make that division and i suppose the cynic in me might say this might be controversial you know please leave a message in the comments below let me know what you think but maybe the reason they got so pissed off about the big teams potentially leaving was because they thought oh we're going to be stuck with all this shit who knows you know because they don't seem to respect any of the rest of the clubs in the league no I, 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 the, the cynical view yeah that the, the, some of the pundits will jump against it because all of a sudden it goes well Hang on, this is our job. You know, this is our this is our income that it's affecting. It's not just the fans. It's not just the mm. clubs that are going to be affected. It's them. They, you know, suddenly that Premier League show, the you know Monday night football or Sunday night football, whatever it is, suddenly won't have as many viewers because, to be frank, that the bigger teams aren't going to be there. Yes, they're going to be your 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 biggest income. They're not going to be asked to go in. That they don't. A lot of them don't do do their research, like you say. It, it's not difficult to do. You know, we we do plenty of it. You know, we we both we both work full time in our in our jobs. We we do this as as, as a you know a little bit of a little bit of fun, basically, isn't it? It's it's not you know it's not our full time effort, but we put plenty of work into it, and that's what these pundits should be doing you know they they obviously have outside interests as well but if you're going to get asked to go on to to, to these programs and and Merson was a great example because he his comments about Newcastle fans were, were absolutely shocking mm. it takes five minutes to to just do a little bit of research and work out why fans are protesting what are they what do they want what are they what are they asking for and and, and they're not doing it and it's just, yeah, he, he, I can't see him coming out and, and doing the same thing about Arsenal or, or Manchester no. United. They'll Absolutely come out not. and they'll, oh, yeah, no, we understand why, why you're protesting. Oh, that's great. Why w wasn't that same level of, of understanding there when the other teams were, were protesting their owners as well? It, it's come back to it. it it's, it's hypocrisy. And it maybe things will change. And if there are further protests, maybe they will back them up a little bit more. Well, that'd you know, be interesting but... to see. It'd be interesting to see if, if some of the clubs in the mid table, or you know, in the bottom four, cough, cough, Newcastle United. Um, if we did it, it'd be very interesting to see what the take would be. But just just sticking with that story. So we talked about the reaction of the former players. There was one really disappointing reaction from a member of that Sky team, which I know you want to talk about. Um, and that was Dave Jones. What did you think about the way he reacted to all that, mate? Well, 
I think it was it was a, the bit between him and, and Neville, and, and I think Gary Neville was maybe caught up in in the whole thing a little bit bit more. Mm. But too passionate views about maybe and, and, and maybe it was it was the the good idea to to take that step back from him. But mm. his comments about you know he's back in the the, the fans and, and and what they were doing and. You could read that one of two ways. It's reading the, the protest overall, or is it, or is it backing the fans from disrupting the game? And I, I think Jones was was very quick to kind of put that back on Neville to say, well, mm. you, you're basically just saying that. Well, every every you know, I think Neville had made a comment about you know every fan should be be out there, um, sort of taking a stand and. Uh, and Dave Jones had, had fired back with, "What are you saying that that all fans should should disrupt games and get all games stopped?" And that's I, I don't think that's what he was saying at all. Mm. And I think Neville was visibly kind of taken back by that, and he and he he came back with him quite well. You could see the anger in there from from Neville about what what's gone on, and you know he's and not going to, to shut up and Carragher be quiet. Too, and, yeah. Yeah, Carroll kind of stepped yeah, up from as well, didn't he? Be fair, absolutely. And you know, I just thought it was it was wrong of of Jones to go back with, with that question, and it was even just an understanding of well, you know, clarify your comments rather than firing that question because that just put Neville in a really difficult difficult place. And if it was a misunderstanding about what his comments were about his support of the the protest. Then ask the question. Don't don't fire that one back about when you're just asking people just to disrupt the football games. I don't think that's what he was doing at all. Um, I, I actually think, just, yeah. Sorry, I actually think it was very corporate, and I think it was a voice in his earpiece telling them to say. And it's funny because somebody put a clip on social media. I can't quite remember what it was. I don't think it was that long ago. But I think Gary Neville was on one of his passionate, you know, kind of tirades about racism. In the game, I think he was talking about when he was with England, and he he knew it was happening. He didn't do enough, and he he was really he was really getting into it, you know. And, and the kind of thing that Neville does that we respect him for. And then Jones had to say, "Well, I must say these are the views of Gary Neville, and they don't reflect the views of Sky." And then Gary Neville said, "Well, don't you agree, Dave?" And and he and he couldn't agree because again, it was the voice in his earpiece. And if anybody wants a true reflection into this is a business, and it's all about business, it's the way Dave Jones has reacted. I think uh, Jonathan Walters, ex Stoke uh, striker, put a thing on said newsflash: Sky Sports aren't the angels of uh, of British football and Twitter. And he's right because, you know, wow. Sky Sports are just as much to blame for this game becoming, you know, purely r uh, riddled with greed and and monetary monetary um, concerns over the values of the game. Yeah, I, I, well, it, it stems back to to sort of the the creation of the premier league doesn't it it was a mm. yes I, i'm i'm not going to criticize it too much because i because i absolutely love it um you know yeah, it's, it's a good product yeah it's it is a, it is a good product but yeah it just when you you have a comment and i can understand him coming out and say yes they're the the views of gary neville they don't maybe don't reflect the views of sky but have an opinion yourself He's not going to come back and to say, he's too scared. He's not a big star, is he? Neville is, no. Carragher is. He's not the star, is he? He's just the, the dude who says, here's the two guys, you know? Yeah, exactly. But but have have a little bit, you know, about you and, and, and give your opinion. And yes, fine, clarify it by saying, you know, these aren't the views of Sky. These are my views only. Um, and and say what you what you feel in that sort of environment. You kind of have to. You can't sit on the fence mm. when, when you know something, especially race. You can't sit on the fence and racism. It, it's, it's pretty black and white. You know, yeah. from the sort of the no, no pun intended. Absolutely, yeah. No, yeah. exactly. It, 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 oh, sorry, it, wait. Sorry, I've got something here. Please hang on. I'm gonna join. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's wrong. You know, there's there's no other way about it. It's it's wrong in whatever walk of life. We've said that for weeks. Whenever this has come oh, up, right. and it's coming up too often. Um. So yeah, I think uh, we go back to to that piece that I wrote about them. They must do better. We pay a fortune for mm. for Sky and for for BT, and you know you throw in Amazon and 
your TV license and all that kind of stuff. And we we have to get better product from mm. from these companies. And, and you know, you can't have them. We, we just come back to that comment before. And we can't have them taking sides of one and, and, and not with another and, and 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 leaving it like that. It's just it's wrong. Um, hopefully, this this whole thing will will see you know that change and and maybe some more fans get you know get some backing from you know from the from these companies and and get some more understanding i think that's key just understand them you know you don't have to agree with them but just understand them well that's the thing i mean i think fans have never put themselves out there more than we are right now you know look at the platform we're talking on right now and there's loads of fans that are doing this kind of thing you know whether it be podcasts youtube channels you know, we've got supporters trust up and down the country. Fans fans want to engage with these mainstream media companies, but I don't think it's reciprocated the other way around. And going back to what was said before, there's certain clubs that they want to talk to, you know, they love to talk to Newcastle when it's going wrong. They never want to talk to us about how it can go right. You know, we're a, we're a, a commodity to them. There's nothing better than a fat crying Jordy with his top off and an UFC tattooed on his belly. You know, that, that's that's manna from heaven for Sky. Zooming on the camera, you know, Leeds United getting relegated, bursting into tears, you know, zooming on the camera. They love to see teams like us struggle because they love to see the bigger teams succeed, you know. And, and I think there is a real problem there. And, and like I say, mate, I think that's why we're ter- fans are turning to, to this kind of media platform that we're talking about right now so it'll be interesting to see what happens moving forward you know in terms of any sanctions i think the fa are investigating manchester united people are talking about docking points and things like that you know that's a very very dangerous game to play as well because if the fa start docking points you know they're drawing lines in the sand you know and it's just it could get a lot uglier couldn't it it could it could absolutely any you open up problems with with maybe it's it's not the fans of those clubs that then cause problems and it, and it backfires on that so we'll see what they do um but yeah hopefully we'll, we'll see some changes in the in the media and, it, and it's like i say we just just be fair with with everybody don't you know that this this whole bias of the of the top four top six it has to it has to end and we've got to be fairer across the board Absolutely, 100%. So so for now, we're done with in the news. Uh, a nice big story to cover, and uh, we'll uh, finish up today. Well, that's all the time we've got for, for this week's episode. Thanks for joining me again, mate, talking about football again. No, it's been good. Um, obviously, plenty to talk about again, so uh, we'll see what happens this week and see what we've, we've got to chat about next time. Absolutely. Now, listen, guys, if you like this type of thing, please remember to like the video, uh, click subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think about some of the subjects that we've been talking about this week. Or, you know, if you're listening on, on the audio, you know, please leave us a comment on whichever podcasting platform that you guys listen to. So so that's us done for this week. And we'll be back next week unless we get red cards from far for fucking anything, really. God knows what we'll get sent <laughs> off for these days, mate. But for now, it's, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me again. Thanks very much, Thanks. guys. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye-bye.